Hello and welcome to Decoding the Gurus, the podcast where an anthropologist and a psychologist listen to the greatest minds the world has to offer and we try to understand what they're talking about. I'm Matt Brown, with me is Chris Kavanagh, and with me is a third person. Uh, it is Professor Kevin Mitchell. Welcome, Kevin. Oh, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So, um, Kevin, we've got you on because we've both read your book and we've um, enjoyed it very much. So for everyone else, though, Kevin's an Irish n- neurogeneticist. Is, is, is that correct, Kevin? Sure, yeah. It's a bit of a, a, <laughs> made up, a little fudgy, fudgy term, but yeah, why not? It's, it's something like cognitive anthropologist, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, so you're a professor of genetics at uh, Trinity College Dublin, and your research focuses on the mechanisms of neurodevelopment and how that contributes to cognition and behavior. Now, the book that Chris and I both read and enjoyed is called Free Agent, How Evolution Gave Us Free Will. So um, to start us off, Kevin, I thought before we jump into free will and we, consciousness. Ma, ma. Wait, what? before, I'm, I'm not going to start with consciousness. <laughs> I just, I have a, a non-book related question for Kevin that I just wanted to clarify before we start. Yeah. Kevin, I'm from Ireland as well, mm-hmm. <laughs> in case you didn't notice. The, I, I did the, notice. The, <laughs> yeah, the, the north part. But I've listened to a couple of your interviews, like with Robert Sapolsky and stuff as well. Yeah. And I, I'm really bad in general with Irish accents, but I couldn't work out where your accent is from. And I think yeah. it's like a distinctive, well-known Irish style accent. So I was just curious which... No, mine is a, from a, Dublin? A, mine is a mix. I, I live in Dublin, but I was actually born in the States. So oh. I, yeah, yeah. I lived in Philadelphia for, you know, till I was nine. And then I moved to Dublin, had a proper good, proper Dublin accent, uh, but then <laughs> but then moved in my 20s to California. And I had to tone oh. it. I had to tone it way, way down. Especially all the all the swearing just didn't go over well at all. So then, um, yeah, I spent ten years in California and then moved back to Dublin. So I have a bang middle of the Atlantic weird yeah. accent that I can only apologize for. I, no, I like that because this gives me more credibility as I detected something slightly different. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, you did. As, I, I'm actually much better than I give myself credit <laughs> for. So that, that was just because I initially thought you were from Northern. Ireland, which yeah, you know I, I, get that. I get that a lot. I had a taxi driver one time who flat out refused to believe that I was not from Belfast. Despite, I, yeah. mean, I just told him I was not, but uh, he didn't believe me. So, yeah. yeah. I yeah. guess we're um, dialectically kindred spirits. Chris. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I like your accent. It's beautiful. So it does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah, uh, melodious and soothing. I listened to it for and Chris too for many hours with uh, with the audiobook <laughs> version of your book. And uh, Chris, if you ever write a book, you better get someone else to um, uh, yeah, I don't read like it. I'll not read, not read it. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but you did a good um, job, Kevin. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was a whole that was a whole thing that reading the audiobook was. Uh, I'd never had done had done that before, and it, man, it's tiring. You, you really have to uh, work on your diction. And I was cursing myself for writing long sentences with eight clauses in them and, <laughs> and no breath points. So, uh, yeah. so, so yeah, how do you do I'm it? Do you, do you just do you just do it in shifts, and you, you like you talk for a yeah. couple of hours and have a break? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Full on, you know, in the studio, it was um, five days recording with, uh, you know, the sound guy and the producer in my ear. And she'd stop me every once in a while and say something like, a little bit of mouth noise there, darling. Could you just do that again? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's lovely. I, I think, Kevin, you might not be entirely cut out to be a guru, though, because in our experience, that's one thing gurus have no problem with. They can talk uninterrupted uh, for 30, 40 minutes without any real need for prompting or, or a check. So, yeah, if yeah. you feel at all self-conscious about it, yeah, you need to train that out of you to become all a proper right. All right, yeah. <laughs> But look at you two. I was there all business, 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 trying to get to the, 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 the meat of the matter, and you have a, a nice chat. I'll, I'll bring us back to business now. Um, okay. So before we get into the book, which I, I want to – Give, give our listeners a bit of a a bit of a, a a whirlwind tour through it, but one of the the bits that I really appreciated about it. In fact, I'm thinking of even prescribing it as a sort of a supplementary text to my students because I teach uh, physiological psychology when I'm mm. not too busy, and I think what psychologists often miss is that 
evolutionary grounding in in this is this is how it all came to be and it's yeah. it's sort of presented the brain and its functions are presented as 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 a baroque mystery and a fascinating little mechanism or whatever but there isn't really much discussion about you know how it came to be the way it is so how how do you see it? Do you see like an like an evolutionary point of view is absolutely crucial to understanding how the brain works? I do. I mean, I would say that for for everything in biology, you know, it's a sort of a truism that nothing in biology makes sense except through that lens of evolution. So, and especially for something you know really complicated like like free will or human cognition, you know, I think we have the probably the most complex form of cognition, presumably on the planet. And to try and understand it just in that most complicated form, right, from the get-go is, first of all, you're, you're, it's just too complex to get all of, the, all of the bits, right? It's easier to build up an understanding than to just approach a really complicated thing, right? Like you wouldn't, if you were interested in principles of aeronautics, you wouldn't start with the space shuttle, right? You'd start with the Wright brothers or paper airplanes or something like that, you know? So you can build up some concepts that we need to have grounded to understand cognition in humans that's the approach that i that i wanted to take and especially i think that's true for things like agency because i mean partly because and free will partly because it gets really tied up in humans the debate does with questions of moral responsibility and consciousness and uh, you know ethics and all sorts of other things which to me are very important interesting questions but they're extra questions you know you can ask a more basic question how does any organism do anything? And that was the approach that I wanted to take. And again, you can build up and ground an understanding of concepts that you're going to need, right? But they sound mysterious. Um, things like purpose and meaning and value, right? They sound kind of mystical and unscientific, but you can get a, a nice grounding of them, I think, in very simple organisms. And then you can approach, you know, how that is manifested in humans. So, so yeah, I'm a big proponent of the evolutionary approach. I mean, if we want to understand how intelligence and cognition and agency work, then we can under, we can approach that by looking at how they emerged, uh, you know, and how nature got there. That seems yeah. to be a useful approach. Yeah. I might have a little bit, a slight <laughs> tangent even before you've got into it, Kevin, but it seems yeah. a good time to ask it it's that, you know, you're active online and will have come across all the various bad evolutionary psychology or yes. the, the big focus on, on race and IQ mm -hmm. online. And uh, I, from that, I see a, a often a legitimate reaction about like skepticism around yes. evolutionary psychology approaches and kind of wariness about anybody who is, a, you know, applying an evolutionary lens to human psychology and human behavior. And for all the reasons that you just talked about and Matt mentioned, I, I think it's unfortunate that that's the case. But I, I'm wondering, just uh, in your experience or your thoughts on the issue, how to go about for like, say the layman, right, mm -hmm. who doesn't know the ins and outs of evolutionary psychology or, or behavioral genetics, how do you go about distinguishing between reasonable uh, mm. like people looking into the topic versus the the kind of culture war poison yeah, yeah. stuff god it's so it's so difficult and it's a sort of a constant battle to be honest so on the evolutionary psychology front i think you can think of it with the capital e capital p you know the field that that self identifies as evolutionary psychology which is mainly concerned with the idea that we humans evolved you know in our recent human lineages under certain environmental conditions that we are adapted to and that our modern lifestyle is you know conflicts with some of the things that we're adapted to and you know there's some there's some truth to that. I think there's some useful insights there. And there's also some very facile sort of just so stories that can be reached for. And it becomes, you know, it can be very difficult to distinguish the good ideas from the bad ones there, you know. And, and so generally speaking, I don't even know that they're, they're quite untestable, right? That's the problem is that they tend to be just a hypothesis and sometimes they sound they sound good. They make sense. For example, the idea that we are predisposed on uh, having access to fatty food to eat as much of it as we can, 
right? Because the, uh, we didn't get meat that often, and uh, you know, it just makes good, it made good evolutionary sense to do that. But that that is a mismatch with our current. Um, environment because we have access to high fat food all the time as much as we would want, right? And then it leads to overeating and sort of maladaptive outcomes. That's one that makes complete sense to me. There's lots of other ones that that don't, well, they sound plausible, but then, you know, about, you know, say men being hunters and women being the nurturers and stuff like that. And, you know, first of all, even if that was true, and even if it does make a kind of a mismatch with current society, which is not a given, it there, there's usually a follow-on from that, which is that it that it ought to be that way, right? It's this mistake of taking an ought from an is uh, and saying, okay, you know, clearly in ancient times when we were cavemen, men were hunters, and and that's the natural way of doing things, and therefore we should be like that now. But the therefore just doesn't follow, right? I mean, the whole point of civilization is that we don't have to be beholden to any of those kind of, you know, the biological legacies if we don't, if we don't want to be, and if as a society we decide not to be. So, yeah. yeah. Um, mm. So I think on the, on the evolutionary psychology front, what I'm proposing is that it is small case E and small case P, <laughs> right? It's just like, it's like an evolutionary, it's just a part of doing biology, right? You can't be doing biology without an evolutionary approach, really, you know? Yeah. That, that's my feeling anyway. And so, you know, the evolutionary sweep that I'm taking here is much, much longer, right? I mean, it goes all the way back to the beginning of life, frankly. And so I'm not making kind of, you know, sociocultural claims in this case. Yeah, I think in some respects it's not universal because I I think there there is plenty of good work in evolutionary psychology around like kind of cultural evolution. Uh, work. Absolutely, some of it, yeah, yeah. Some of it is speculative, but like Michael Tomasello's work mm-hmm. on shared intentionality and that kind of thing, or or comparative psychology studies with other primates tend to be, I think, very good work in general. But the uh, I think what you're kind of pointing at is that. The more hyper adaptionist, like speculative claims that you hear, for instance, in you know Brett Weinstein talking yeah. about the, the Nazis being a, a specific lineage um, of the German lineage, right, and the evolutionary dynamics there, that 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 tends to be stuff that you should be wary of. Whereas a, a lot of the work, and I would say, like in your book, is more focused actually, as you say, not entirely on humans mm-hmm. and actually quite a lot on the like evolutionary processes in other species in general. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I, I think when people are actually talking about bi- biology and like neuroscience, that it often it's a lot better than when yeah, they're purely yeah. focused on culture, even though I do like some of the cultural evolution stuff, but yeah. Yeah, yeah no, and I didn't want to give the impression either that the that evolutionary psychology, you know, that as a field is all bonk or anything. Like, not at all. There's tons of great stuff and very important insights and so on. It's just that it lends itself to yeah. these really simplistic kind of hypotheses that can't be tested. And then it's just bad it, it's not even it's just bad evolution and it's bad psychology combined basically yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah so yeah. that doesn't I, I, that doesn't help yeah yeah I, I just wanted to underline another point you made there which is that there's the capital e capital p evolutionary psychology which as you said i like some of it and, and some of it is absolutely terrible but i mean more broadly i i i struggle to talk about it with people because they they immediately think to that but often what i'm talking about is what is what you alluded to which is that mm-hmm. it, it's more of a framework which underlies everything that you do yeah. um and informs it e- even if your focus is on something else so for instance i do a lot of work in addiction you know mm-hmm. um, the various behavioral addictions we see for instance that cross-culturally there's a bit of a, a universal phenomenon where say um gambling and other risk-taking behaviors are elevated amongst young men we don't have a good explanation for that, except that taking an evolutionary perspective actually provides at least some interesting avenues to yeah. explain it. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I think that's a great uh, example that that young men being more um, prone to taking risks. There's a very good evolutionary explanation for that, and it's a it's a 
I mean, it's not just evolutionary, it's an ecological life history explanation of what it is that that teenagers should be doing and you know it's not an aberration it's i don't know if you know sarah jane blakemore's work she would say it's a perfectly adapted part of the life cycle they're doing exactly what they should be doing that's the whole mm. that's you know it's part of the ecology there yeah so i think that's makes them that's right annoying they interact with <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah. I did want to um, just pick up on the other um, part of the question, Chris, that you asked me about the behavioral genetics side, because mm. that is another area where it's just super, super easy to take really simplistic readings of, a, of what's actually a complex and nuanced kind of field. And so, for example, you know, you could say, well, these people have shown that such and such a trait is heritable. And what they mean by that is across a population that they studied, where they see some variation in a trait, say, imagine like height, right? So there's some tall people and short people, there's a distribution. And you can ask how much of that distribution is due to differences in genes versus something else. And that proportion is the heritability and it's a really technical concept in population genetics but of course it also, it sounds like just a colloquial term right it, how how genetic something is and the, it's easy to get those things mixed up and it's also easy to infer that because something is partly heritable in some population that it's therefore genetically fixed and that it's completely innate and that it's immutable and those things don't follow actually right and it definitely doesn't follow that just because you have some trait that's heritable in one population and then you see a difference in the trait between two populations that that difference is due to genetics right there's no it just doesn't follow from that at all the difference could be entirely environmental because all you've done in your one population is surveyed the set of of variation that actually exists right so for example if you if you looked at body mass index it's really highly heritable within a given population. Right? It's very strongly genetically driven in that sense. How uh, how much your your sort of appetite control, energy balance set, where that set point sort of is. But if you look across populations, you see huge differences in average body mass index that are completely cultural and societal. Right. Mm, yeah. So yeah. So the heritability thing is easily easily misunderstood and widely misunderstood sometimes wantonly i think and um yeah then you get into all kinds of really unpleasant sort of stuff especially in the in the online world yeah yeah it, I, I didn't think about that carefully until recently and i correct me if i've if my rough understanding of this is wrong but if if the the sort of natural inclinations to think about um a heritability component and and a non-heritable component and they're just like two two bits it's a, it'd be a percentage it could be 20 20 80 50 50 mm -hmm. and they just sort of add up but you can imagine that bec because one component is is modifiable like the environment if if you had an environment which is extremely homogenous like everyone grew up in a similar circumstance or whatever then almost by definition any variation that you did observe would be a hundred percent genetic yeah. Yeah, um, that's exactly right. Yeah. On, I guess on top of that, again, correct me if I'm getting this wrong. They they also interact. So yes. as well as well as there being the, the additive bit, that it gets yeah. more complicated again. Absolutely. So you're right on both counts. So the heritability is a proportion that applies to a given population studied at a given time, right? And so if there's very little environmental variance in that population at that time the heritability will just be very high because it's the only thing left making a contribution, right? But it, that doesn't mean that, they, that environmental factors couldn't make a contribution. You just haven't done the right comparison. Right? Yeah, so that's, that's absolutely true. And then, sorry, the second thing that you said was, was spot on as well, the, and I've just forgotten. Oh, it. the um, interaction. Oh, the interaction. So, yeah. So in order to make these calculations, you know, if you're doing twin studies or family studies or population studies, people generally just make some set of assumptions that make the mathematics possible. And one of the assumptions is there's no interaction between genetics and environment. And we absolutely know for many, many traits that that's not the case in humans, right? So, you know, for example, for something like intelligence and educational attainment, there's totally a genetic interaction with the environment because we share an environment and we share genes with our parents who create the environment that we're in, unless you're adopted. And so there's a massive sort of confound there in those, in those kinds of studies. That doesn't mean they're not trustworthy at all. It just means that the number 
of heritability that you settle on is like it's it's sort of arbitrary to a certain extent right if it's 80 percent or 70 percent it doesn't matter it's not a constant you haven't discovered the speed of light it's just a descriptor of what's happening in the population you're looking at at the time yeah yeah well let's let's um bring this back to i guess the beginning kind of of the story that you uh take in your book and i uh, i heard you on an interview recently you know making the point that actually it, it's quite helpful to think about like a a single celled organism or a little worm wriggling about in the ground because you know we may not like to think about it but we've got we've still got an awful lot in common with those Mm -hmm. simple organisms in terms of the basic existential facts of being an organism in the world that that needs to eat and defecate and hopefully find a mate and not get eaten so maybe maybe start us off with that with that journey of of you took yeah so the reason why i did that was because you know the question of free will starts or hangs on things like how how could it be that we could make a decision right how could we be in control of our actions if we're just neural machines Uh, and you know it's just our brains doing things and they push us around we're just the vehicle of our brains right or even you know even worse how could it be we're in charge of anything if our brains are just physical objects made of atoms and subatomic particles and ultimately quantum fields and whatever. And physics says all of that is just going to evolve uh, as a system in a deterministic fashion, right? So it's just the laws of physics are going to determine where the atoms go when they bounce off each other or, or whatever, right? So where where are you? You just disappear in that. There's no, uh, you know, if that's true, there's no doing. There's just lots of happenings. There's no doings in the, in the universe. And it turns out that that problem doesn't just apply to humans. It applies to anything, right? It applies to any living organism, this question of agency. How could any organism be said to do something, to act in the world, if it's all just physics that's deterministically driven you know, by, by these low-level laws? And that's you know, why I wanted to start there. And also for this other reason that I mentioned earlier, that I wanted to disentangle the question of agency from these what I take to be secondary questions of moral responsibility and consciousness and things that are, you know, sort of uniquely human and even uh, sociocultural in some ways. So I wanted to get at the more basic biology. And I think you can, you know, in order to do that, it basically took me back to the question of what does it even mean to be a living thing? Right? What's the difference between living things and non-living things? And for me, one of the big differences, living things act they do things, right? And non-living things don't. And that it's funny because it's so fundamental, that property of, of agency. And yet, you know, if you open a biology textbook and you look at the, the list of the characteristics of life, agency won't be on one of them. It won't mm-hmm. be in the index. It's just not a thing that's talked about as a central pillar of what it means to be living. So it, if I've understood you right, I mean, it's partly like a levels of description, like what's the best level at which to understand a phenomena? So we could be trying to understand how a star works or how chemical um, interactions work. And th- there is a level of description there in terms of things happening. But if you want to shift to say, okay, well, why is that tree growing leaves or Mm -hmm. why is the worm heading away from the light then you're not going to find your answers at that lower level of description yes but it's deeper than that actually because you could say that right and and some people would say so um the physicist sean carroll for example has this idea that you can have these effective theories at different levels which are just useful but in a sense they're they're almost useful fictions uh, because all the low levels, all the real causation is still happening at the lowest levels, right? Mm-hmm. So you could say your tree is growing here and you could give some reasons for it. But actually, someone else could say, no, look, it's just the, the way the atoms are bouncing off each other. How, you know, your, your, your level of causality is kind of an illusion. It's, it's convenient, but it's not where the real business is happening. So what I want to do is something, is something even deeper than that, right? What I want to say is how could it be that the the level of describing the tree and what it's doing is the right level, right? That it's not that all the causation is not at the bottom. Actually, how could that be? How could how could life have elbowed its way out of basic physics and and gotten some some wiggle room to become living things with organization where that there's some macroscopic kind of causation, not just microscopic physics. 
So, um, yeah, so the, the looking, the evolutionary story gets kind of metaphysical pretty quickly, actually, yeah. because it has to dig into what do we even mean by causation? How could it be that there can be some causal slack in the system that enables the way it's organized to have any, any causal power in determining what happens? Right. So, yeah, it gets, it gets, <laughs> it gets deep pretty quickly. I might, I might push you forward more levels than <laughs> you're yeah. intending, Kevin. But one of the one of the questions that I think comes up with this, and it, when I was listening to the book, it it was something I was waiting to hear as well. And I think you explained it well, but you can probably do it <laughs> better in person. So, whenever in discussing the the kind of organization of the brain and, and neural activity and mm. why it makes sense that, like you're talking about, it isn't just an epiphenomenon to talk about the, the kind of collective upper levels and the, mm. the kind of assessing of patterns and this kind of thing. That, to me, it did sound like you're talking about the causality going from the bottom up, but also coming back down right yeah. that, and and being able to to work from the top down Absolutely. but i think for some people that will be a, the part which is like kind of difficult because yeah. how how can it be going in that direction if everything relies on the fundamental processes so is, could you elucidate a bit about you know how patterns and you described it very beautifully, so I'm sorry to try sure, yeah. and make you... No, 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 you've hit... Uh, yeah, no, you've absolutely hit on the sort of major problem that, that people have with this view of, of top-down causation, because it sounds like uh, it couldn't possibly be in play if, indeed, all of the causation is already exhausted at the lower levels. So, and and... So, I mean, the basic uh, starting point here is to say, well, all the causation is not exhausted at the lower levels. Like if we look to physics, if we look to quantum physics and even classical physics, this idea that it's deterministic is just not supported, right? There's just no good evidence for the idea that classical physics even is deterministic in the sense that the state of a system right now, plus the laws of physics, completely determine the state of the system at some subsequent time point, right? And a time point after that, and after that, and forever and ever and ever and ever. Right? That's that view just doesn't hold and isn't really supported by physics, even though many people take it as as sort of proven. Right? I could Fact. be. I could be. What I mean, let's let's <laughs> let's. Well, are you referring to the quantum? Quantum dynamics, like a, Not, a, the uncertainty there, or is something else? I, I could be one of yeah, those people. Well, so there is, doesn't quite <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is the quantum uncertainty, right? So it's it it is in the first instance, literally physically impossible for a system to exist in a state with infinite precision at any given time point. Right? Yeah. So the idea that you that you just have a system, you know, it's just given with infinite precision, the description of the of the system, and then it evolves from there, just isn't true. It, it, it just can't hold in the universe, right? And that's from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and other things. But also there's another principle, which is simply the case that information is physical, Right? It's not just some immaterial floating around kind of thing. It has to be instantiated in some physical form. And that the amount of information that can be held in any finite bit of space is, is finite. Right, You just can't pack infinite information into a finite bit of space. So the idea that at the Big Bang, it, it already contained all of the information of everything that's going to happen for the rest of time, including me saying this sentence and you hearing it is, I mean, it's ludicrous on its face, but it's also just sort of mathematically and physically impossible, right? There's good physical physics reasons why that couldn't be the case. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so what you have is uh, systems that have a little bit of fuzziness uh, around the edges, as it were. And, you know, for lots of things like the solar system, it, that little bit of, of imprecision doesn't matter it, because they're very linear systems. They're very isolated. And of course, we can make these great predictions and we can land little rovers on comets and all kinds of stuff. It's amazing, right? But most systems in the world are not like that. Most mm -hmm. systems are actually chaotic and, and they have lots of nonlinear feedback, which means that tiny imprecisions or, or bits of indefiniteness in the parameters at any point over some time evolution lead to the future being genuinely open. 
Right? There's lots of yeah. ways the system could evolve, depending okay. on how these sort of random digits take on values as time progresses. Yeah. So that's my that's that's my non-physicist understanding of some of that physics, and it's contested, right? I, I don't want to I don't, don't want to just say this is the way that it is, uh, <laughs> but it's a way that I mean it fits it fits better my intuitions about you know certainly the idea that that everything we're saying right now was prefigured and predetermined from the Big Bang just sounds silly, right, and absurd. And it doesn't have to be that way. And physics doesn't say that it is or prove that it is. Yeah, look, I mean, I mean, part of it obviously is totally uncontroversial. There is, like, you, you, the, as you said, you can't compress all the information into into the Big Bang. There's there is uncertainty and, and randomness being injected into even physical systems all the time. Yeah. And there is room for emergent behavior, complex systems that are that are interacting with with, with many moving parts. And I, my my go to when imagining this is always thinking about the weather and thinking about hurricanes yes. and things. And I suppose to put words in your mouth, see if this is the kind of position you would hold. If you're looking to understand why, say, a particular molecule of air or even a leaf blowing around the wind is doing that, then you can and maybe should be pointing to the hurricane, which is, of course, mm-hmm. a, a, um, an, an emergent complex system, which is absolutely not predictable if you if you roll back the clock a thousand years or so and that is legitimate and sometimes you know you argue that's that's the correct um yeah. attribution of causality for that phenomena yeah so so let me pick up first on one thing you said about you know the idea that there's randomness constantly being injected into the system i think that's probably that's not the way i have come to think about it because it's a it, when you think about it that way, it sounds like the randomness is this positive thing that is like coming from nowhere and just appearing in the universe, right? Where and and that's problematic. I think a lot of it's the reason why a lot of people kind of object to the idea. It's like where is this coming from? I like to think of it just as as an indefiniteness in the future. Ah, uh, yeah, right. It's an un, it's a negative. It's an absence of full determination. So the present state underdetermines. Uh, what happens in the future based on just the low-level laws of physics. It could go lots of different ways, right? And then what becomes interesting is to ask, okay, well, what else could influence the way that a system evolves through time? And what else is the way that it's organized, right? I mean, you referred to a a tornado, the self-organizing or a whirlpool, right, is a collective kind of phenomenon where what all of the water molecules or air molecules are doing constrains what each of them is doing, right? So they collectively make up this dynamic pattern that in turn constrains what all the parts do. And again, that's, you know, it's, it's a sort of a non problematic, non controversial view, I hope. Right. Yeah. Um, and what you can do is, is take that a little step further and say, okay, well, what about What if the way a system is organized had some function, right? And the, and this gets back to these questions of purpose and meaning and value. So if we think about a living system as like a storm, in a bubble, right? It's it's this set of chemical reactions that are all reinforcing each other collectively, right? So they they generate this regime of constraints that is made by all the bits, but also constrains all the bits to keep that pattern going through time. Well, then, right? If a living thing, you know, the ones that are good at it persist, and the ones that are bad at it don't, right? So it's a kind of a tautology, but it's the basis for all selection. So we could have ones that are configured one way or configured another way, and the ones that are configured in a way that helps them persist will persist through time. And that kind of configuration can come to take on the form of uh, functional systems that, say, allow a bacterium to detect things in its environment and embody a control policy that says if you detect a food molecule, you should go towards it, and if you detect a high pH, you should move away from it. Right. So then we've got some functionality embodied in the organization of the system that can do work in the sense of determining what happens, right, or settling what happens in an adaptive fashion in a relative to this purpose of existing. Right. So we've got purpose in a non mystical, non cosmic kind of way, just this sort of tautological way. We've got value because some some it's good to go one way or another relative to that purpose. And then we've also got meaning. This is a new kind of causation in the world that non living things don't show, is that the bacterium is sensitive to information. Right? It's it's buffered. It's insulated from physical and chemical causes outside it, 
by its cell membrane and its cell wall, but it's sensitive to information about what's out in the world, and that information has meaning, right? And it's the meaning that's important for what happens. And, and ultimately, after you know billions of years of evolution, you, you you have the same things at play in in us, where it's meaningful states of neural activity that are the important thing. Yes, they have to be instantiated in some physical pattern, but the details of the pattern are actually arbitrary. That's not where the causal sensitivity lies. It's what the patterns mean that's important. And that's why I think anchoring that view in these simple systems, I hope at least, lets us get a grip, get a grip on these sort of slippery concepts, a bit nebulous, vague sounding, and lets us operationalize them in a, in a, you know, a firmer way. And then we can go from there and scaffold our understanding of more complex systems on the back of that. I want to like dig a bit more into the biology and the cognition, Kevin, but uh, yeah. unfortunately there is one philosophy <laughs> that is still floating. And I just want to check if I understood correctly. So one, one thing that I fairly often encounter when debating with people about determinism is this notion that if you wind the clock back and you mm. set everything up, you know, and replay that, it would all go the same way, right? And, and this is one of the, the kind of thought experiments that you said every atom in the same way and you saying something different would happen because it can't right now. My answer to that has typically been that relies on assuming that the universe is, as you described, like there's a ribbon going and we know that it would all go. And that, I, my argument is just, we don't know that. We, we yes. don't know exactly that it you know the way that it is but there there are different opinions amongst people about the position and on that i detect <laughs> that that you are saying something similar uh about that we cannot just assume that the future is completely yeah. set and use that as the the foundational premise to yeah. argue but but on that as well if it were the case that the universe was deterministic in that manner. I'm just curious, does your model about high cognition functions and, and kind of top-down causality, does it completely rely on the universe not being deterministic in that manner, or could it be yeah. incorporated into a model with that? It, it Well, yeah, so it's a great question. It's the question, really. So... In a sense, you could say, let's take the universe as it is right now with all these sort of cognitive systems moving around in it, like you and me, and say, okay, now let's assume it's deterministic. Could you still do anything, right? Would what happens still be up to you? And to me, that, that thought experiment has <laughs> suffers from the problem that it just assumes the existence of agents in a universe like that, right? First, you have to show me how, how you would get agents who, who are trying to do things and expending all this energy, apparently trying to take action to make things happen that they want to happen when all of the causation is actually still deterministic. And what that means is that it's reductionistic, right? It means it's not just that it's determined, it's that all the causation is still happening at the level of atoms and, and subatomic particles and quantum fields and, and so on, right? So for me, the, the big question there would be, well, why would you ever get living organisms in a universe like that? And I'm not convinced that they would ever emerge. And mm. so the main point I would make is that uh, physics just doesn't say that determinism is true. So why does everyone start with that premise in the free will debate? It just drives me bananas. Like, it, like, <laughs> and you see people, like they'll, they'll just accept determinism. Even people who are arguing, they'll accept determinism. And then one of them, so um, Greg Caruso and Daniel Dennett, for example, had a book out recently called Just Desserts, which is very interesting to, uh, to read. It's mainly about moral responsibility, really. But it, they both accept determinism, this single timeline. And Greg Crusoe ends up just being a free will skeptic, which, you know, is really denying the phenomenology of our everyday existence completely, that we do make choices and, and have some control over our, over our actions. And then Dennett ends up being a, a compatibilist, which is basically the view that despite the universe being deterministic, we can still assign moral responsibility to agents for their actions because the causation comes from within them. So, so Chris, that's the view that I think you know is quite common, actually, and it's the one that you you're alluding to, where you can make this sort of construct 
where you say, okay, even though there's no real choice in the in the in the universe, right? The, there's only one possibility that will happen. You're still part of the causal influence there. The way that you're configured is part of the causal influence of what's going to happen. Therefore, we can still blame you, right? That's that's Dennett's view, and it's. I, I'm trying to be. Uh, I'm trying to be charitable about it, but I find it incoherent, right? I just don't think it, it could possibly hold. So so for me, the roll back the tape experiment, first of all, I wouldn't start from that, that premise, right? If you yeah. start from determinism, then you have to ask, well, where could the freedom come from? And it, But if you start just by accepting the evidence for indeterminacy and an open future, then you have to ask a different question. It really interestingly flips the script. Then you have to ask, well, shit, now all these kind of things could happen. How does the organism make happen this one thing that it wants to happen? Where's the control coming from, right? And that's where I think the, the ironically, in a sense, the answer, right, the power to control what happens comes from the indeterminacy itself. Not, not directly. It, it allows macroscopic causation to emerge, to evolve, right? So it's a necessary condition. And, you know, some people would say, Look, either the universe is deterministic physically, in which case I'm not in charge of anything, or it's indeterministic, in which case my decisions are just driven by randomness and I'm not in charge of anything. And there's a third way, which is what I'm arguing for, which is, no, the indeterminacy just creates this causal slack. It allows macroscopic organizations to emerge. And because we have this selective force through time or uh, process through time, then what you will get is macroscopic organizations that do things, that allow organisms to do things in the world and become loci of causal power themselves. So in your model, Kevin, is it that the fact that there are agents in the universe, as distinct from like objects and Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, non-agentic things, that is the key evidence that indicates that the model, uh, you know, the the universe model cannot be purely deterministic because without that, agents can't function. And Uh, if that's the case, I can imagine that one of the objections that that would arise would be, is that putting too much emphasis on the, like, the fact that there are agentic beings on our, you know, random little rock. We don't have any evidence yet for anywhere else in the universe. So uh, the, the fact that we exist still needs to be explained, but it, there's a big universe that, and agents are only as far as we can see on like our planet. So yeah, I guess I'm not freezing it very well, but I'm just wondering, you know, that it, it, it's, it's putting a lot of work it is, on the agents. It is. Well, so what I don't want to do is suggest that the, that I wouldn't say actually that that my theory, my way of thinking about this rests on that. What I would say mm-hmm. is that for the compatibilists, it's a thing that they need to explain, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that that's part of what happens is that agency emerges because it can, right? Because there's this little bit of causal slack that allows life to wiggle free uh, and, and to become causally efficacious as entities, right? Whereas for compatibilists, I think that's a thing that they just assume is the case, right? Right now that these agents just exist. All I'm saying is that, wait a minute, you need to explain how that w- would happen in a fully deterministic universe. So yeah. And uh, you know what? Let me just say one other thing about the control uh, issue and the idea of winding back the clock. So first of all, I, you know, the, the question is whether you would ever do otherwise. And I would say, actually, what the organism has to do is prevent otherwise from happening, right? If it wasn't trying to do something, all sorts of stuff could happen, right? So it has to exercise con- some control to make happen what it wants to happen, but only only within certain limits, right? It doesn't have to worry about all the microscopic details of all the atoms and everything like that. It just has to achieve you know, its goals, wh- whatever it wants to happen at a macroscopic level. So again, it's not you know, it's not concerned with trying to put every atom in its place. It just has to do, <clears throat> excuse me, what it wants, like take a drink of water here, which I will. <laughs> well, I think so. I'm going to take the opportunity to pull you both back from the brink of an <laughs> abyss of philosophy. Um, 
<laughs> because, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's all above my pay grade. I don't really understand. I, I, I sometimes wonder whether or not, like, that there are a lot of, just like in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, there are a lot of questions that seem to be well-formed questions, which seems mm. like they, they, they should have a definite answer. But, but they're off, that they're kind of just words that people use. And, and just because the question, do I have free will, sort of makes sense in English and feels important to me, I, I sometimes <laughs> wonder whether or not the, the, those, those, like, it's just a, not a very good question. Um, well, it, it certainly has some hidden layers to it, right? And when you say, do I have free will, people would often say, well, what do you mean by free? And what do you mean by will? And what they should be asking is, what do you mean by I? Right. It's like, what is the, what is the self? And that's not a Jordan Peterson version. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was also going to say, what do you mean by have? <laughs> well, I mean, I think just in case anyone thinks Kevin is transforming into Jordan Peterson, I think what you're um, alluding to is, is that, uh, I guess, physicalist perspective yeah where mm -hmm. where th there is no ghost from the machine there isn't yes. a little homunculus you can identify in your brain that is you rather we're a big messy thing yes uh, as you emphasize uh, we're organisms that do where our boundaries our skin or the cell membranes are important but still we're a fuzzy construct and the like localizing the eye anywhere isn't really possible in that from that point of view yeah exactly and i think you know there's sort of two extreme views of the self. One of them is this dualistic kind of theological view of a, it's not even just necessarily theological, but of an immaterial kind of thing, right? As some sort of substance or object that is, that is attached to your body somehow or inhabiting your body, the ghost in the machine, as you say. And there's no, you know, that's just not a useful kind of construct and there's no evidence for that. But the other extreme, and I was listening to your recent interview with with Sam Harris just this morning, actually, um, where, you know, someone like Sam Harris or, ma or many others would say, well, actually, the self is just an illusion. And it's just, uh, you know, when you look to find yourself in your experiences, you find nothing but the experiences. And therefore, there's a, there's a kind of a follow on from that, which is, therefore, you can't have free will because you don't exist as a self. You're not the kind of thing that could have free will. And to me, that's just a mistake because you can have a self that's not localizable. You can have a self that is the, the continuity of pattern through time that still has causal power as a bundle of memories and attitudes and dispositions and relationships and, and all, you know, all the rest of that, right? That is a, a really efficacious thing without being a separable, isolatable object. And mm -hmm. that's fine, right? It doesn't have to be an object. There's no reason for that. And it can still have existence. So that that's where I would fall down on that. And yeah, now we're going to go down a whole other philosophical no. rabbit, rabbit hole. <laughs> Selves can have can be systems. We should get that on t-shirts. Selves yeah, can be well, <laughs> systems. Systems can be selves. I mean, that's exactly like the whole thing with living organisms. That's what they are, is there are patterns that persist through time, and it's the persistence through time that is the essence of selfhood, right? It's not a thing that you can isolate either within an organism or in an instant of time. It just doesn't apply. The concept just doesn't apply to an instant of time. It applies to the continuity through time. That's what makes a self a self. So, Kevin, some people, I think, in hearing that, uh, especially people that are you know somewhat sympathetic to Sam Harris's kind of position about the self will point the thing like the famous Leibniz experiments mm. or split brain research, right? Indicating that at least in the popular presentation that although we think that we are the authors of our actions consciously, a lot of the work, so to speak, mental work is going on under the hood unconsciously. And there's a kind of post hoc story that is appearing in mm -hmm. the in the mind afterwards right and i <laughs> i i kind of already know but i i i'm wondering if for our listeners you could explain why that isn't the case that those experiments have not dealt with the yeah. um the kind of position that we we are just passengers who believe yeah. that we're at the steering wheel but right. we're, we're mostly you know unconscious 
yeah. motives pushing us along? So first of all, there's just not one answer, right? There just doesn't have to be the same kind of thing going on all the time. It may absolutely be the case that in certain circumstances, we're kind of on autopilot and we're not thinking about what we're doing very much. And there are sort of um, subconscious influences that are informing and or even if you want to say driving what we do, right? And so, you know, for example, in the, the Libet experiments, where you just have to kind of lift your hand every once in a while, and there's this um, so-called readiness potential that's detected in, in brain waves. if you do an EEG while people are doing that, that suggested that the brain was making the decision before the person, right? And was only telling the person afterwards. Now, first of all, there's a whole bunch of technical reasons why that just doesn't apply. It doesn't look like the right interpretation. But secondly, even if it were, like, who cares? That scenario, why would, like, they literally tell people do something on a whim whenever the urge takes you. So imagine I'm the subject, right? I've made a decision. I made a conscious decision to take part in this experiment. And now I'm sitting there watching a clock and just every once in a while they tell me to lift my hand. They have told me that I should lift my hand on a whim. So occasionally I do. And, you know, if you let your brain sort of decide that, fine, that's a good, that's a good strategy there. You've got no other reason to do it. So, you know, a lot of the decisions that we make, I think, fall into this range. Either they're completely habitual because we've been through this sort of scenario before, we've done all this learning, we tried things out, we know what's a good thing to do here. We don't have to think about it. All that work is pre-done. We've offloaded it to these sort of automatic systems, which is great, super adaptive. It's fast. And it, it makes use of all the learning that we've done. And then, um, you know, then there's sort of ones where we don't care. We don't really know what to do. We're sort of indifferent, uh, but we should do something, right? That's the important thing is that we shouldn't just dither or vacillate forever. We should just get on with things, right? And a lot of the decisions that we make are like that, where we control them to a certain extent, but, you know, we don't care about the details. And then other cases where we're really kind of, at a loss. You know, it's a really novel scenario, something where we really don't know what to do, we have to deliberate, or it's a really important decision. And we have to really think about it. And then we do, right? So we take this sort of conscious deliberative control. So generally speaking, I think that, you know, the evidence from neuroscience, where people extrapolate from one particular setup, and say, look, see, it's always like this, and we never have control. Well, that just doesn't follow, right? It's just a, a non sequitur, if you allow that, we can be doing different kinds of cognition that has a different level of conscious involvement in different scenarios. Now, Kevin, I got to dwell on those motor readiness potentials a little bit, and that's purely because it gives me an opportunity to remind people that that I uh, worked on those during my PhD. In fact, I, was, I did my PhD in an EEG lab, and uh -huh. just I, I was mainly interested in the signal processing aspects of it. But uh, I picked those readiness potentials, um, lateralized readiness potentials, and that paradigm where people could elect to, you know, push a button basically whenever they felt like it. And uh, just to let people know the methodology there, the the idea is is that you know they, people press the button whenever they feel like it. We, we we know exactly when they press the button, and then we can look at the, the event related potential they call them, but going back in time by a couple of seconds. And, and what we see is this slow depolarization across the cortex uh, when that happens, and that methodology you mentioned and this is one of the things that I, I thought was really cool as a first year phd student and it was only till a few years later that i started to think about it a bit more carefully and <laughs> putting aside a lot of methodological quibbles for instance the subjectivity and people saying you know just nominating when it was they decided to mm. to, to press the button bit of it and i'm sure there are other issues that you know about there kevin i mean the thing that occurred to me with that is that it seems like an of course it, it like for, for you to have a thought or, or to form an, an, an intention to, to, to generate a little motor uh, program to, 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 to do anything or intend to do anything, then, then by definition, if, if, unless you believe that there is a spirit that is, that is entering in the brain and making that happen, then there has to be something physically going on in the brain for that attention to, intention to arise. And so when I thought about it, I thought, well, this is kind of, and of course, you, you would, mm. it would almost be surprising if you didn't detect some kind of activity in the brain before people formed a conscious, the conscious awareness of planning to do something. Is that kind of how you see yeah. it as well? 
It, it is. I mean, like I said, and like you just said, there are some other technical quibbles about the interpretation of, of this thing where the readiness potential starts to ramp up, you know, maybe 350 milliseconds before the movement. And yet people say they were only became conscious of the urge to move, you know, 50 milliseconds before or something like that. And so part of the, the technical thing is that when you time lock to them actually having done something, you see this gradual ramping up. But if you time lock to some arbitrary signal, like a, t- a sound or something, then what you see is that sometimes the, the activity goes up and goes down again, and sometimes you know up and down, up and down. So the start of the activity going up is not, in fact, a commitment to move that your brain has decided. So anyway, that's a technical thing on that front. But yeah. but yeah, more generally, like yeah, there's a whole field of you know many people saying. Look, it's not you doing things. We can go in 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 neuroscience and we can see it's just this part of your brain is active, or that part, or it's just uh, you know we can go in in animals and we can drive the activity of these different circuits, and it really looks like it's just this big neural machine, and it's it it is driving activity. You know what does it matter what the states mean to you cognitively? That's not where the causal power actually is, and that for me is a mistake. I think because you can show, in fact. That it's what the pattern it's the patterns that are important. It's not the low level details, and that this attempt to to reduce cognition to particular neural activities is is a mistake in, in two levels. First of all, it's not the right level of sensitivity because the neural details are somewhat incidental. They're somewhat arbitrary. It's the, the meaning of the pattern that's important. That's what the system's causally sensitive to. And secondly, it's very reductionist in the sense of isolating. A particular circuit and saying, look, it's this circuit that made you you do that, right? Whereas actually the, the way the brain works is this much more holistic kind of thing where all the different parts are talking to each other. They've all got different jobs. They're monitoring different things. They're interested in different bits of information over nested time scales. They're providing context to each other and data to each other. And they're all trying to settle into a big kind of consensus for, for what to do. And that is not a this sort of mechanistic system, and it's not even really an algorithmic system. It's a big dynamical system trying to satisfy lots of constraints and optimize over many, many variables at once for the reasons of the organism and on the basis of the things that organisms are thinking about. So, you know, once you're at that stage, you might as well say, well, that's the organism deciding what to do for its reasons, right? Like, what else would you want? There's a nice illustration that you give in the book that a lot of people take, you know, the it's a very, it is a very good illustration of the way our cognition and our attention can cause like blind spots, right? The, the famous experiment where you ask people to count the basketball mm. passes and a man in a gorilla suit walks on and most people don't recognize it because their attention is focused on the task. And you you could easily see that if you ask people to look for a gorilla suit, <laughs> that they would 100% pick it up, right? Yeah. So it, it it is, that to me struck as a good example that taking from that experiment that our minds are, you know, completely, we're completely driven by unconscious mechanisms is a wrong uh, extrapolation. And similarly, just in all of the things that you were both saying there, I, I keep coming back to this thing that kind of raised it with Sam as well, that like habits and unconscious things and so on, to me, these all seem like components of self. It, like, yeah. I guess this is the problem that self can mean so many different things, but I am my habits. I am my you know, Absolutely. cognitive heuristics and that kind of thing. So saying like that basically it has to only be the the kind of very, very high level top down conscious reflection, which is the self, yeah. is kind of creating an artificial divide because and- if it isn't you who... Yeah. Who is it? <laughs> Absolutely right. It, so it sets, and, and you know, um, Robert Sapolsky has a, a new book out. So he's a, a neuroscientist from Stanford. He has a new book out called Determined, which is making the complete opposite case to the one that I make. And it's very, very similar to Sam Harris, actually. And it's sort of ironic in that, um, you know, Robert is a, a reductionist and a behaviorist, I think. But he's also in this, has this sort of dualist intuition. Right, where it's like if it's not this disembodied thing, self doing it, 
if it can be shown, if these processes can be shown to have any physical, biological instantiation, then by definition, they're not you. And it's not you doing it, it's just the biology doing it, right? And it's just a, it, it, it's setting the bar so high that it, it's only by definition rules itself out, right? It's just not a useful way of, of arguing about it because it, it says the only way you could have free will is by magic. And here we're showing there's no magic, therefore you don't have free will. And just it's sort of a circular, yeah. ar- facile argument, frankly. And, you know, instead of that, we've got this fascinating biology that we can get into, which can say, well, how could it be that all of this machinery working, right, all of these neural neural bits and pieces and so on can actually represent things that we're thinking about, where the thinking has some causal power, uh, you know, in the system without that being magic. That, for me, was the was, I guess, the project that I was more interested in. And to me, I think you can come to a naturalistic framework that that allows you to think about those things without appealing to any kind of mysticism or descending into this mechanistic reductive determinism either. I think there's a middle middle ground that we can inhabit. Yeah, yeah. It's it's interesting these conceptual divides like where and I, I've come to realize this in talking to people who are clearly very smart, very well educated, sometimes in a different field, mm-hmm. usually in a different field. <laughs> but um and maybe that's the problem. But I think where where the three of us um share a lot of common ground is that we operate from a heuristic which starts off which is first of all materialist and physicalist, but that just acknowledges that there are there are emergent properties um yeah. there, there there are systems of interacting agents and then it can be meaningful to to talk seriously about things that are happening at that level and they are in a sense you know they're they're virtual things in in a sense right mm-hmm. and i'm thinking here of like representations and information sure they they're, they're not magical ideas they they like you said earlier on that information has to be represented somewhere physically mm-hmm. but it it isn't just like a pattern just by itself that has like a like a high degree of shannon entropy can can the, the, there's no physical discrimination between total random noise and um, a bitmap of a cute cat. The the the, the difference is in, in the information, but you can't point in a reductionist sense to, yeah. to to where that lives. So first of all, yes, I think what what's interesting when you have start having these discussions is that you know you can be looking at the same evidence as somebody else and coming to a different conclusion, and that usually means you're bringing different things to the table, right? You've got some sort of outlook that may be implicit or tacit that that you know, is often worth kind of scratching into and to figure out what that is. The other thing, you know, with with what you were just talking about with information is that we have a really good science of information, right? We have information technology, we have whole fields of, of industry built on it. We don't have a good science of meaning. I mean, there is, you know, fields of semantics and linguistics and psychology and so on. Uh, I'm sorry, have, have you read Maps of Meaning? By I just, I, that seminal work, it might have been super. I, it's on my, I just want to make sure. It's on my list. Uh, it's on my long list, Chris. It's, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the thing about meaning is it's hard to localize. It's hard to quantify. It's inherently subjective and it's interpretive, right? It's not encoded. It's not, it's not just encompassed in the signal or the message. It's in the interpretation of the of the message, right? Yeah. And so there, it's inherently a systems thing. It's just not something that you can localize and point to and quantify and so on. So it becomes more difficult to have a good science of it, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. And, you know, if we're not doing that, if we're not thinking about meaning, you're not thinking about biology in the right way because living things are are sense making, right? They're they're extracting meaning, they're running on meaning. That's how they get around in the world is what they need, right? They need meaningful information to get around in the world. So yeah, again, it gets back to this idea that there are some very fundamental principles and concepts that I think are key in biology that have been kind of overlooked, uh, maybe in our in our physics envy to get to really mechanistic explanations. But I think they have a rightful place, and I think we can have a science of them that isn't woo, Deepak mm. Chopra kind of um, stuff. For our listeners, they will have heard about many of the gurus. 
talk about the importance of meaning, the importance of sense making in a different context, yes. right? But I, I'm wondering if you could give an illustration like, so when you were talking about, you know, the human brain and neural processes and how it is that you could have the kind of pattern from collections be the the signal or or something that is being interpreted at a higher level where the individual components are not the the core thing it's more the gradient right uh, yeah. across it so i'm i'm going to do a bad job of explaining that but i i think if in terms of having a higher level like semantic or or associative pattern could you give an illustration of how that could apply like in the in the way human cognition works uh, how it could feed down like so that it's more important than the individual uh yeah. like neuro neurons firing sure i mean i guess a, a a sort of commonplace experience would be that you know say you're we're reading some text and the text could be written in one font or a different font or in italics or in bold or all in capitals or whatever and it would all mean the same right so the 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 particular instantiation is not that not that meaningful because we categorize a bunch of different shapes as a and we categorize a bunch of different other different shapes as b and other different shapes as c and so on right so all the time we're doing that kind of a thing right we we are categorizing semantic concepts like that at a high at a high cognitive level into these categories where we are only interested in the differences when they push the category from one where they push the pattern from one category to another right so we're attuned to the sharp borders between the categories that make up these letter shapes, but we're but we allow lots of variability within that. So neurons do the same thing, right? Individual neurons do it. They they there's this idea of that comes from you know basic kind of starting neuroscience with reflex arcs, where one neuron fires and it drives the next one and it drives the next one and so on, right? So it's this electrical machine. And I rather would reverse that and say, look, what's happening is that this neuron here is monitoring what its inputs, right? And it's doing some interpretation on the signals that it's getting. Because for example, it may, you know, this one may be sensitive to the rate of, of incoming spikes of action of, of signals from another neuron, but not the precise pattern in some cases, right? So the precise pattern is lost. All this guy cares about is, did I get 10 spikes in that last 100 milliseconds or did I only get five? And if it's only five, I'm not firing. And if it's 10, I'm firing, right? So it's an active interpretation. And I think the same thing happens with populations of neurons where you have one population that's monitoring another one. And if this lower one takes on uh, any of a bunch of patterns that mean A, then this this guy might fire because that's what it's sensitive to. Whereas if any of the a bunch of patterns that mean B, this guy won't fire. Okay, so that that that's what I was kind of referring to before about the the causal sensitivity in the system being at that higher level of the patterns. And the important thing is that uh, the sensitivity gets configured into the system because the patterns mean something to the organism. They carry information about something out in the world or the state of the organism or one of its ongoing goals or any of the other sort of elements of cognition that it needs to figure out what to do. Does that did, did that did that answer the question? I, I I mean, I think you can couch it in in cogn at cognitive levels, but actually what you see is that the neural instantiation is 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 the same process happening. Yeah, I mean, you actually reminded me of of uh, some intuitions that were, for, for me at least, anyway, very fuzzy, but I, but very satisfying when I was reading your book, which is that I, th I think you're hinting at that nonlinearity in these systems is really important, and you know, there's 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 this sort of you know like a gradient of anus, <laughs> but uh, or Venus rather. <laughs> let's let's careful, go with Venus. Careful. Let's go with Venus. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, and it fires or it doesn't. So so there's a nonlinear act activation there. And when you don't have those sort of binary binary boundaries, it, and I think you could even extend this analogy to. To, to cells, like it being very important for, for cells to have a cell membrane to, so, so that their activity of being active or not or whatever is separated from, from the environment around them. Because if everything is just diffusing into everything else and there is just these, these, these linear gradients, then you really don't have any scope for, for interesting and complex behavior. And I, I, 
I, I can't articulate it. I I'm sure I don't understand it properly, but it just feels intuitive to me that 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 idea of sort of transitioning from the from the from continuous messy mm -hmm. uh, simuli physics to uh, a kind of, uh, almost like a computer binary representation is is really important for for all the things that make big brains interesting. Yeah, I mean I think well first of all you've touched on a really really fundamental issue about what life is which is that it's it keeps itself right it's a pattern of of stuff and processes that keeps itself out of equilibrium with the environment right so if it's in physical thermodynamic equilibrium then it's just in it, there's no boundary there's no entity it's just uh, it's not a thing it's just a constant you know part of the flux right it's one with the universe you don't want to be one with the universe yeah so that that's absolutely a fundamental principle of what life is and then as you as you go through into you know into individual cells in a multicellular organism those cells still have some degree of autonomy right in the sense they're still trying to make sense of what's out in the world right there's still this barrier the cell membrane they're still taking in information and they're sensitive to it and they're operating on it and each individual cell will have a sort of criteria that embodied in it for what it should do when it sees this signal or that signal right and that's basically how knowledge gets embodied and, and procedural knowledge gets embodied into our brains through learning is by changing the weighting of those of those criteria that each neuron or each population of neuron is acting on. So yeah, that's where it comes to be the case that the system, a neural system is really doing cognition, right? Cognition is not an epiphenomenon. It's what the thing is doing. It's just using its neurons to do that um, and to, you know, I mean, the, this gets back to something that, that um, Sam Harris was saying in your recent interview about this idea that when you think about yourself as an experiencer, what you find is just the experiences, right? You're just having some percepts at any given moment, and there's no self there. And I just think that's really mistaken, actually. I think it's a mis mistaken intuition from his introspection because, in fact, the whole point of perception is that it's this active process. It's not passive. We're not passively sitting here being bombarded by sensory information, or at least that's not what our percepts are made of. Our percepts are the inferences that we actively draw from that sensory information. That's our self doing something, right? If you're not, the, the, that a non-self can't be doing that. That's an action that is required or an activity that is inherently subjective uh, where the organism is bringing all its past experience and knowledge to the act of perception. So it's a, it's a filtering, it's an interpretation. Uh, it's not just this passive sort of flow of, of things, that of experiences where there is no self doing the experiencing. Yeah, one of the, one of the introductory concepts you, you have to get across to undergraduate students is, is, is to correct that intuition that even something like vision is, is analogous to like a video camera yeah. that is feeding a video stream into the brain, where of course if there is there is so much processing going on that that transforms it and and probably reduces information in the in the in the Shannon entropy sense. Yeah, it simplifies it, but but it makes it far more comprehensible and allows you to actually do something with it. So it's yeah, I think that is incontrovertibly true that it, it's mm. a, even simple perception is an active process. Yes, yeah, and we have to. I mean, because for organisms, again, it comes down to what they need, right? What do they need to get around in the world? They don't need to know about the photons hitting their retina, right? They need to know what they're bouncing off of in the world before they hit their retina, right? So they need to make some inferences. And it's a, it's a hugely difficult problem, this, this inverse problem. There's loads of potential patterns that probably could make the same uh, pattern of photons, right? So you have to do loads of work. And it's a skill that organisms acquire, right? That they develop the, the skill of seeing. And yeah, it's absolutely sense-making, though not in the not in the guru sense of <laughs> sense-making, I think. Well, I thought that this was a good time uh, to raise the issue of consciousness. I uh, get one question. I get uh, one question <laughs> about it. It's purely, uh, again, because reading your book was was very refreshing in this regard for me. It helps, Kevin, that I, I agree with almost everything you say. Uh, but even if it wasn't, I would have I would have found it intellectually stimulating. But the one thing for me is that I have consistently 
not being puzzled by the concept of consciousness. Okay, mm-hmm. because for for me, when and I am approaching it, I think primarily from the view of a cognitive anthropologist, right? So, for example, that human cognitive processes make ontological categorizations quickly to separate things into agents, objects, living things, mm-hmm. uh, spatial entities, and so on. And we we have some evidence that these are cross culturally pretty consistent, even if you know the taxonomical categories that each culture invents are, are wildly different, underpinning it, and quite consistent things in cognitive processes. But so when I think about consciousness, to me, the, the obvious kind of connection was that we are agentic beings that mm-hmm. are able to imagine potential different futures and, and to try and think about different outcomes. And we model ourselves in different outcomes or different situations and and kind of mentally time travel into those scenarios while also thinking back experiences that we've had in the past. So it seemed to me that humans have quite a sophisticated agent modeling cognitive apparatus in their mind. Mm -hmm. And that from that, I would anticipate that some sense of self slash consciousness would be a very likely a component of having such a model. It would be, I just imagine it as like, okay, so the the model is set up this way and would work like that. Now, Matt assures me that that is something I'm inserting to the model that doesn't Mm. need to be there. But I, I just find it hard to comprehend how you would have such, you know, good modeling abilities without some you know, like kind of it self agentic aspect yeah, yeah. of that. So why is Matt wrong? That's the, that's the question. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> yeah, I think I mean so I I absolutely I think agree with you, Chris, that that sense first of all, yes, we we model all sort all sorts of things, right? So we model ourselves, we model the world, we model the future, we think about what could happen, right? So we have this imagined imagined future that we're sort of simulating, we're weighing up the utility of various predicted outcomes and so on. The question, however, is why that should feel like something, right? And so here, here's the pushback. I'll, I'll, I'll give maybe, <laughs> yeah, right, so Matt's, Matt's uh, encouraging me here. Um, so the pushback is why should that feel like something? Because maybe you could design a sort of a cybernetic system that has those functions in it. And in fact, many other, you know, other animals certainly do have many of those functions, just maybe not to the same level that we have, not to the extent of the sort of time horizon that we're concerned with and so on, right? Um, so the concern would be, well, but yeah, you can build all of those things. You can build more complex control systems where having those functionalities give better adaptive control of behavior. But why does it feel like something? That's the really important bit. And why does it feel the way it does, right? And so one one counter to that is that actually what we're doing, what we have a capacity for in humans, is modeling not just doing these sort of um, simulations of objects in the world and states of the world and states of ourselves, but modeling the processes that are doing the modeling. Right? So we can think about our own thoughts. So here we get to this kind of recursive idea that really, you know, probably most uh, nicely articulated by Douglas Hofstadter, for example, in I Am a Strange Loop, where the, the idea is we get to a, a level where we have enough levels of our cognitive cortical systems that the top ones are looking down on the on the lower ones where the the objects are now the thoughts themselves we can think about our thoughts we can reason about our reasons and it may just be that once you have a model of yourself thinking and you're in you're using that as part of the control system because you can use that to direct your attention to think about other things maybe that just necessarily feels like something that's what like what it is for us. Now it's also possible that there's a there's another way that it feels to have the kinds of control systems that other animals have that are sentient that are clearly responding to things in the world that are sensitive to states of the world and states of themselves so they probably still have some kind of experience but they may not have the same kind of mental consciousness that we have which is really a world of ideas and thoughts that are somewhat abstracted from these um, more basic kind of cognitive operations Ma, I, I know I said one question I just have one slight <laughs> comment and yeah it's good because Kevin can 
expertly rebut, right, and, and explain in technical details why. But so I, everything there makes sense, Kevin, and also that I, I might throw shade towards, no, well, it's not throwing shade, but just saying that this might be the cognitive processes that med- meditators are so interested in. But, you know, because we have this recursive aspect that they draw some unwarranted metaphysical conclusions yeah. from that, but it could just be a fascinating process within the way that human minds work. In any case, the one like kind of point that I've raised the map before and I, I, I'll raise it to you as well, is that, so when you were saying though that, you know, why is it, why would it be, or, or like, that it feels like this or that you can create a system where you have all of that, but you don't have the phenomenological experience. And my, my kind of reaction to that was, but we've never seen that anywhere yeah. in the world. So it's a theoretical possibility, yeah, yeah. but it, it's never yet happened. So if they make something which is exactly like yeah. that and which lacks it, then that would, that would be true. But at the minute, it feels to me like a kind of thought experiment to say. Well, well it is. It's the it, it's the zombie experiment, right? It's it's Chalmers' philosophical zombie experiment is that you have everything is happening exactly the same as in you, but it doesn't feel like anything. And you know, I yeah. don't think I don't think for me the idea that you can conceive of that has no weight in any kind of argument by itself, right? Conceivability is not an argument. But I I mean, there's two ways you can see it. Either the phenomenology pops out of the way that that uh, thing works, or which is equally problematic, it's added somehow, right? There's this extra bit that is the phenomenology. And that's what Chalmers thought experiment is sort of getting at is like, you could, there's something you could subtract and have everything else left. And I, that doesn't make much sense to me either. Yeah. But I think there's another way you can think about it, which is there is a phenomenology that emerges. And then that phenomenology has some, has some uh, ad- adaptive value to it and some causal efficacy in terms of being able to think about abstract thoughts of this just so there we're just into metacognition and what metacognition gets you as a part of a control system and it gets you for example the ability to not just have a thought but to judge the thought so so you can have a belief and then say wait should i have a, that belief how certain should i be how con- what's my confidence level in that belief that's going to inform my decision making here because i think such and such but i'm not really sure so maybe i need to get more information or maybe i shouldn't jump here and so yeah again i think you can operationalize the metacognitive stuff much more easily in terms of control system behavioral control and so on the what it's likeness for me i mean i didn't even try to to address it because I just don't know, right? It's a huge, it's it's the maybe it's the biggest mystery that we still have. I certainly don't have an answer to. Well, the, the very very last thing just to say is that the, I think the example that you give in the book about you know schizophrenia, where people experience a voice, an internal monologue, not as theirs, but it is generated by their, their brain, right? Yes, that that, that could give some you know indication that the when the brain is not functioning entirely properly that you you can have the sensation of intrusive thoughts yep. from elsewhere so yeah anyway matt that's that's, that's it i promise i won't mention consciousness again <laughs> i'm very satisfied <laughs> no the c word no that was fine that was fine actually kevin kevin Sanders, i think brought some balance to the force because <laughs> you agreed with everything you said i do too i, I sign off honestly to to all of that i can definitely see the adaptive benefits of having those self-reflective processes and yeah there's a lot of evidence for, for all of that so so chris rebels against the idea of of anyone calling anything <laughs> mysterious because he thinks it's hitting uh-huh. it at something magical and i suppose where i'm coming from is Again, emphasizing I sign off on all of that. I, I just do find it just at a, at a gut feeling level a little bit mysterious, like where the consciousness, like this this thing that he, whether whether it pops out or it's or it's or it's added on or, or whatever. I, I guess like maybe I find the idea of P zombies not entirely. Um, uh, illogical, like I can imagine it being pretty possible, and all of the AIs that are floating around, you know, I think show that you could make a pretty convincing simulation of something that does do sort of chain of thought stuff and does have some ability to reflect. It doesn't seem implausible to me, and just that there. But so we just have the, you know, I guess Chris's argument is, well, you know, we're we're complex agents and we're conscious, so 
you know, why is it mysterious? Because we have proof. It just is. And, you know, yeah. I, I accept that. I accept that it just is, but I, I still find it a bit odd. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, it is mysterious uh, in the sense that we don't currently understand it. So I wouldn't, uh, yeah, I, I agree. I just don't think that that means it's, that's a statement about us. That's not a statement about the thing, right? Yeah, so it's, yeah. a, it's well, the statement is, we find it mysterious. That's yeah. a description of, of, of us, <laughs> not the thing. So it doesn't, mean it's, it doesn't mean it's always a mystery in and of itself. It's just, we can find out. Yeah. I mean, lots of yeah. other things used yeah. to be mysterious too. So Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it feels mysterious to me. I also feel hungry sometimes and a whole bunch of other things. So uh, I agree. I, well, I just had a, a kind of, it's a bit of a speculative uh, query, but I'd be, I'd be curious, Kevin, that with all the AI advances and Matt and I make use of ChatGPT and Claude quite mm. quite a bit in our, our work currently, um, and I've generally been impressed and things are improving. And I, I'm just wondering if any of the AI developments and the things that are going on there, if you have any thoughts about, you know, how that relates to all of the, yeah. the stuff that you've put in to, yeah, thinking about the agents and yeah, agency. Yeah. I mean, I do, yes, I do have thoughts. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I mean, they're, I'm not an expert on the on the AI stuff, so I'm I'm sort of this is filtered through my understanding of of what these systems do from talking with people who who work in the field and so on. So first of all, I would say, you know, there's a question about whether these systems have understanding, and then that raises the question of well, what the hell do we mean by understanding? What does that entail in in a natural agent? And I think you can build up this view of a map of knowledge about the world, knowledge about causal relations in the world, exactly the kind of things that we need in order to simulate an action and the predicted outcomes from it and so on. So that's actionable knowledge. It's it's causally relevant kind of um, descriptions of the way the world works and the way the self works in it. And that's the kind of thing that you know large language models don't have that because they're not interacting with the world in the same way. They're not causally intervening. They're not acquiring causal knowledge themselves through that intervention. However, they have all the text of all the people who've ever been interacting with the world. And so they can mount a really good simulation by making a, a perfectly plausible utterance in response to some prompt. And so it looks like they understand things, but it's a sort of a parasitic you know, understanding. They don't have a, a world model they have a world of words model, which is a separated kind of a thing, right? So, yeah, so I think what would be interesting, although potentially dangerous and ethically uh, fraught, would be to think about, well, what would it take to build an agent, right? Not to build artificial intelligence, but to build an intelligence, right? An entity. What would that necessarily kind of entail? And I think if you look at the, the architecture of cognitive behavioral control, that I just, just described the evolution of in the book, you could see there are ways to make a being that has that kind of architecture, which is not just an internal thing. It's, a, it, it's an architecture of relationships with the world that is an ongoing thing that allows it to learn what to do in different situations and so on. And that leads to intelligence having an adaptive value where intelligence pays off in behavior. Right? It's not an abstract kind of a thing like playing chess or something like that. It's like, I need to get food. Where can I find it? So, yeah, I think there's a, there's a route that you could at least imagine where you build an artificial agent that interacts with the world in such a, in such a way that intelligence becomes selected for and ultimately emerges in that, in that system if you allow it to kind of evolve or iterate over, over designs or, or, or so on. Uh, but right now, the things that we have are these sort of um, disembodied, disengaged systems that I don't think are entities and that I don't think have agency because they're not designed to. It's not a knock on them. That's not what they're for. Yeah. So I think it's a, it's a really, really open field. I think it's really exciting. And again, I think it's very ethically fraught because if if people go about making artificial agents, then we're going to have all kinds of questions about responsibility 
for those agents, responsibility of the agents and what they do, and all kinds of other sorts of questions that we should, probably should figure out before anybody goes about building one of them. Yeah, I guess one of the things that um, the uh, many people are worried about AI for many different reasons, but uh, one, one thing I notice amongst the uh, AI doomers, the people who are, who are very, very concerned about AI, perhaps going a bit beyond legitimate concerns and getting into a bit of speculation, is, is they definitely do imagine that an intelligent AI, like a hyper-intelligent AI, would sort of immediately hop to uh, a lot of human motivations. Uh, so yeah. uh, the, the argument goes, okay, it becomes very intelligent. It is naturally going to want to persist. It is naturally going to want to exert some control over its own destiny, and this will make it want to kill all humans is, mm-hmm. is kind of how the argument goes. And I, I think from your point of view, the you know, as you just mentioned, evolution has invested us and, 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 and all living creatures with those imperatives. So it's very natural for us to assume that, yeah. that something intelligent is going to happen too. But I personally suspect not. But how about you? Yeah, no, I think the, the order is important, right? What happened in nature was the purpose and, and meaning and value came first and intelligent systems emerged from that because it's useful relative to those goals, right? Those, those standards. I don't think that this kind of systems that we're seeing now that are built for these, you know, things like text prediction and, and, and so on, even though they have this great corpus of, of words that they can kind of build an internal relational model of, I don't think agency will just pop out of them with the current architectures. I, I think you'll have to do something different. I think you'll have to embody them. You'll have to give them some sort of skin in the game. Uh, yeah. You may have to, you know, to, yeah. in, in order to get that. Yeah. So I don't see the, the Doomer stuff, you know, I don't see Skynet or Ultron emerging from chat GPT uh, in its current incarnations or, or any further incarnation that has the same architecture. I think we're probably safe on that front. There's lots of other reasons to be worried about uh, the influence of AI systems as they're applied in the world. But those are more um, societal, not, not technical, I think. Yeah, you, you've with. made me a happy man already, Kevin. I feel like you've restored balance to the <laughs> universe uh, by yeah. making us both feel that we're correct. That's <laughs> like we're <laughs> like children. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was trying to explain to Chris because you really did help because you you, you laid it out in a way that the Chris could agree with and did agree with 100%. And I, I do too. And uh, my thing all along was we do agree, Chris. I just I just think it's just... It's just a little bit mysterious that that there's a subjective a ph- phenomenological <laughs> experience of it, and that's all. Yeah. That's all, and n- nothing yeah. else. Uh, I'm happy. I'm, okay. I'm, 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 we're on board. We actually agree. That's I right. think you can. Yes, you can. You can feel that it's mysterious without adopting a mysterianism uh, <laughs> philosophy, metaphysics, right? That yeah. just committing committing to it always being mysterious for all time. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I know why you react to that statement, Chris, because I agree. I'm with you. I don't like the people that turn it into some mystical, you know, mystery that, we, that you've got to find a, a place for spirits and poltergeists. It's and- just the it's it's not the issue about what people do, like the Pak Chopra and stuff. Like, of course, we all agree that, that that's mad, right? And Or the people that really fix it on using quantum indeterminacy to justify everything. Right, like it would, just as a get out of jail free card. The bit that I just tend to bump into is that I just kind of think because of all the processes that we've discussed about agents going around in the world and, you know, trying to model things and so on, that the fact that it's like something just seems to me like, Yes, it has to be. Oh, I would like maybe it's maybe it's a failure of my imagination, but I'm just. Yeah, like, I was going to say that. <laughs> what's what's the al- what's the alternative? And I can't imagine it because it's the only way that I know that that process works. So I can theoretically imagine a world where it isn't. And yeah. whenever I encounter beings that are doing that, I'll be interested to discuss that's what the their inner worlds are like. Yeah, <laughs> but, that's that's the tricky bit. Um, have you? Uh, do you know Mark Soames's work at all? S O L M S. Uh, very, very interesting stuff about really sort of basal kinds of conscious experience that are basically emotional. You know, triggered from the from the brainstem, and they convey what are essentially control signals, right? Homeostatic signals that say, "I'm my food levels are low, my my osmotic balance is off, my sleep." Dead is too high. It's too cold out here, right? You know, so really, really basic things that basic organisms feel. And he has a sort of a theory that these these have to be 
submitted to a central cognitive economy that is trying to adjudicate over them and arbitrate mm-hmm. over them all at once to decide, okay, well, look, I'm hungry and I need sleep and I need uh, shelters. So w- which of them am I going to prioritize at any moment? And these things have a valence, right? They're, they feel good or bad, but just mm-hmm. by itself, if all the, the, the central signal, uh, central processing unit only got good or bad signals, then it would, ne- it would no longer know the source of them. Right? It would no longer know, oh, this is, wait, this is a hunger signal that I'm feeling right now. It's not just bad. It's re- bad relative to that thing that I need to keep track of. And his argument is that the qualitative feel is required in that because there's no other way to keep track of it. Right? You just, it just has to feel like something in order to, uh, for the central system to kind of keep an eye on everything and know what it's uh, referring to. And I don't, to me, there's, uh, it's sort of intuitively appealing. I kind of was like you. I was like nodding my head when I when I heard that, and then I'm just not I'm not 100 percent convinced. But it's but I find that yeah, kind yeah. of a useful way of thinking about why it should feel like something, just in terms again of a control system architecture. Yeah, I mean, like on one level, I totally get it, and I because I've always thought of the of of emotions as as being uh, a modulating influence right to to help help with decision making but i i guess i i still I, this is maybe this is where me and chris are different like chris was saying yes well of course it has to feel like something in order for, for that to be happening but i i i just I, I suppose i can imagine a system that that has modulating it you know call them emotional factors there which is change like reprioritizing things and all that stuff and and they're not having to be a kind of a self and a unitary experience of that going on um yeah i guess that's my objection but yeah Yeah, no again i can i can imagine both sides right i can imagine exactly what you just said you just build a system that has these different sensors to different parameters of internal states and you somehow keep track of them in a central system that arbitrates over them and that's just robotics and and you know computation and then on the other hand uh, I, I'm also tempted to think, well, maybe if you did that, it just would feel like something. Yeah. Well, I guess Chris, I guess Chris, has, Chris has to be right because we do feel something. So. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I don't need to hear anything else about that. Thing. Chris has to be right. That's the only thing that just just, just sam- sam- sample that and, and loop it. <laughs> yeah. So, getting back to the book and connecting a little bit to AI, I suppose, is that one thing that these AIs are indisputably good at is creativity. Yeah. Um, and you, you see it with the image generation and just recently video generation, which is pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, and of course, the creative writing, it might bullshit a lot sometimes. It may not understand <laughs> what, it, what it's doing, but it, it's certainly creative. And I think that's something you emphasized in your narrative of, in the book, of, of human cognition in the context of evolution, that you had at, in, with simpler organisms, I, I guess, a, a lack of creativity. There, there was certainly agency, there was certainly evolutionary imperatives and responses to stimuli, but there was a lack of flexibility, a lack of behavioral flexibility. And, yeah. and at some point, evolution figured out in some organisms that that could actually be a very handy thing. How do you, how do you see, how, do you, how would you describe that? That, that process. Yeah, I, I think that's right. So, so many organisms can uh, react to things in the world. They may have some kind of pre-configured control policies that say, yeah, I should, I should approach this kind of thing. I should uh, avoid that kind of thing and so on. And they may be capable of integrating multiple signals at once and, and assessing effect in effect a whole situation and deciding what's the best thing to do in this in this situation so they'll have systems to do that and they may have systems to learn from experience so that their recent history or even far history can inform what they should do in any scenario but yeah many of them are not particularly they don't have an open-ended repertoire of actions right which is what we do we can really, I mean, within our physical constraints, we can do all kinds of things. We, we can think of all kinds of things that we could do, right? And so the, you know, part of what has happened over evolution is that cognitive flexibility became really valuable in human evolution in particular 
in a sense, probably because it, I think it snowballs on itself, right? The more sort of flexibility you have, the more control over your environment, the more you can move into new environments, which makes it more valuable to have more cognitive flexibility and, and so on. So I think you get this amplifying loop that happened in human evolution, which moved at some point from human biological evolution to human cultural evolution. And then it really, it really took off because then we could, we could share our thinking with each other. So yeah, we have, we have this ability for creative thought. And I think what, you know, we deploy it most of the time in terms of creative problem solving, right? And that's what most, uh, you know, other animals that have some open-endedness to their behavior do that as well. And it's something that I don't know that AI does that, right? You said, you know, AIs are very creative and they're generative, right? I mean, that's what they're for, but they're, they generate new stuff by kind of recombining old stuff, right? So it's, it, I don't know, it's not creative in the same sense as... Uh, that's how I create stuff. Yeah, well, maybe. I don't know how well, you maybe, do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe you're right. Maybe they're recombining, well, I, are they recombining ideas? That's the that's the question, right? Are they having ideas and recombining them, or are they just recombining material in a new way? And yeah, I don't know. Maybe there's not a sharp line between those things. I do think you know one thing's in term in terms of the creative problem solving. Many organisms, including us, have these systems where we can you know say we're in some given scenario we kind of recognize it but there's a few things that we think we could do so a b c or d these are the options that we have and we evaluate them and just decide on one of them maybe we're not 100 percent sure but we decide on one of them and we try that out and it turns out we're not achieving our goals right so we go back and we try one of the other ones and we might exhaust that and and still not be achieving our goals and that then there's a system that can kick in that involves um part of the brainstem called the locus ceruleus or the blue spot that releases norepinephrine into, into parts of the rest of the brain, including the cortex, where the theory is that it kind of shakes up the patterns that are there. So it, it, it kind of breaks the, the patterns out of their ruts, the most obvious things that were suggested to do, and allows it to explore, expand the search space for new ideas. So, you know, thinking outside the box. And then those new ideas are evaluated and simulated and, and so on and maybe tested out in the world. So what's really interesting is that what that is actually doing is kind of making use of the noisiness or the, the, the potential indeterminacy in the neural circuits by not by, it doesn't add it, it releases it, right? So ordinarily the habits kind of constrain it, constrain the neural populations. This system effectively reduces those constraints and lets the populations explore different patterns that they wouldn't normally go into. And, and to me, that's a really just beautiful kind of example of how an organism can make use of this indeterminacy, but it's deciding to do it, right? It's a resource that it can draw on mm. to enable it to expand it's the things that it even thinks of, right? The things that it even conceives of to do in any given scenario. Matt is a AI evangelist in a way, as you can help tell by his description of creativity. So Matt, you, you mentioned to me that, you know, whenever you make with ChatGPT or other LLMs like prompts that encourage them to be reflective and recursive, right? Like think through what you, that you can often overcome like blockages that people otherwise say, you know, they aren't able to do it, but, but if they aren't able to do it, they shouldn't be able to reach it when you kind of encourage them to like go through additional steps, right? So I'm just, I know it's a completely different process in a way, but it seems somewhat analogous to kind of, in this case, the difference being, of course, that we are the ones prompting it into the system. So maybe we are functioning as, as the, the kind of agent in that system still, but I don't see that it would be impossible to create a system that was doing that, you know, from its own set of instructions so is mm. it, maybe it's, it's at you matt and kevin but are is that a completely distinctive process or would you see that as potentially analogous whoever wants the answer <laughs> you're the guest kevin yeah, you go. well um yeah i don't i mean it's it's open to me i you know like i said earlier i'm not probably enough of an expert on the inner workings of those models to to know exactly 
where or whether there's creativity at work. You know, it's a term that's pretty poorly defined anyway, even in human <laughs> endeavors. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't, again, for most of these things, I don't see any reason why they couldn't, this kind of system, what, what, you know, what I just described, there's no reason why that kind of a system couldn't be put into an artificial entity of some kind. I just am mm. a little skeptical that the current versions have that kind of capability. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I, I think um, these, these terms are badly defined. And until we get a really good definition of what we mean by creativity, there's not much point. I mean, personally, I think you could, a good starting point is is just like randomness combined with evaluation in in like a yeah. in like a cycle. And I certainly I like I, I used to paint you know paintings art <laughs> um, badly, but you know my system was to kind of I do abstract art. I'd sort of paint almost randomly. Maybe some intuitions were going in there, but really probably mostly randomly. And then I'd step back and look at it and paint over the bits that didn't I didn't like, and then have another mm. go. And then following that process, and the the finished yep. product can seem like like it, it came about through this mystical process of of, of creativity, but it, it can be arrived at um, uh, algorithmically, al- algorithmically. And I think if you talk to a lot of artists, they'll often describe what they actually do in 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 more prosaic terms. And but I think mm. what what we're getting at is that there's some fundamental issues that confront all agents. And, you know, one example is the conflict between exploitation and exploration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and sometimes you're running around randomly trying out different things. And sometimes you're, you're onto a good thing and you, you you just keep doing it. And it's it's interesting to know that there was a little bit of cognitive science. I didn't know that there was, we'd identified the mechanism there that actually encourages a bit more of the creativity, right? Yeah. And uh, I mean, and Hmm. Sorry, you're exactly right. That exploit explorer problem is, in, which is ubiquitous, is another area where some little bits of randomness can be useful, right? So occasionally, even if you're in, onto a good thing, it pays to occasionally look around and do a little exploration because it's a because you know it's always going to be the case that good times are not going to last, right? Yeah. Uh, and so having that policy built in to the systems that are, are directing exploration or exploitation avoids going down this thing where you're over committing to a certain uh, resource that is definitely going to run out and evolution knows it's going to run out because it has done in the past yeah th- and there's a bunch of other you know systems even in simple organisms where a little bit of noisiness is used as a resource for you know a little bit of variability first of all it's just a it's a feature in the nervous system. It's not a bug. It's a feature that enhances signal processing in many ways. But also, you know, sometimes it's useful, say, when you're avoiding a predator, you know, the last thing you want to be is predictable because you'll be lunch. So, you know, many organisms kind of use some some sort of random randomizer to tell them, you know, which way to jump. Yeah. Well, for what it's worth, the those those deep artificial neural networks have you know, are intrinsically stochastic. They they, yeah. they they wouldn't work very well with, with without that. And but another thing that occurred to me, I wonder if this is related to your thesis at all, which is something that's always fascinated me. And I, I it is is the the credit assignment problem. So with organisms and and humans intelligent agents, you you do some stuff over sometimes over an extended period of time and mm-hmm. and then something good happens. You have a reward, you have a signal that the what you that that's something that you want, but then yeah. you're confronted with this problem where you have to like look back. Maybe it wasn't the thing you just did. Maybe it was some yeah. sequence of steps, or maybe it was this thing you did way back then. And this is this this to me is one of the most interesting challenges I think an agent's got in the world. How how do you do, does that relate yeah. to your thesis at all? It does. I mean, in the sense that as you're building up a model of the world and those causal relations, that's exactly what you need to do is distinguish the real causal relations from the ones that were only apparent, right? And of course, it's super difficult to do as uh, the longer the time frame over which the, the causal influence, the true causal influence obtains. So, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's lots of people working on this problem. I'm not really an expert on it at all, but the, you can see the elements that would have to be required is that you need to have some record of events. You need to have some working memory to, to be able to keep track of not just what's happening right now, but what just was happening and what was happening 10 minutes ago and what happened a week ago and so on. So you can see that it, it, um, it depends on this sort of nested 
set of, of memory systems, and then some kind of an evaluative system that, that can say, this was the important bit uh, relative to that. And it, you know, in many cases, the only way you get that data is by doing it again, right? And seeing that actually across many, many instances, lots of things were varying through time, but these ones all had this same, this same thing in common between them, and that must be what the causal influence was, right? And so that's exactly the system of, that leads to understanding, right? That's, that's what understanding what's going on in, in, entails. And what's interesting is that in many of the, you know, the AI systems, the machine learning systems, they have so much data and so much compute and so much energy available to them that they don't necessarily um, compress things in such a way and abstract the uh, identify the, the salient features. And instead, they often overfit right uh, yeah. uh, to, to bizarre stuff or not bizarre, just arbitrary stuff. And then that manifests as a failure to generalize to a new situation. And so the ability to abstract true causal relations from noisy experience and then generalize that to a new novel situation where that's useful knowledge, to me, that is what understanding is, right? I think that's a reasonable sort of description of, of understanding. And it's something that I feel like most of the current machine learning models don't come close to. I've just got one more question for you, and then we're gonna we're gonna let you go and get about your day. Okay. Uh, this is the last one for me, I promise. I, and this is out of curiosity. I mean, I, I'm gonna let's we're gonna simplify it a fair bit. But you, you know how in like uh, explanations for the in evolutionary terms, the explosive growth, I suppose, in in human intelligence in, mm -hmm. in relatively recent evolutionary history, there's to simplify a lot there's, there's kind of two explanations right there's the um, humankind being the tool maker all right we got smart because being smart means you can make really um, good tools understand the the physical environment get hunt prey better avoid predators all the rest and then there's kind of another explanation which is more of a intraspecies um, competition explanation which is that our 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 social environment started to get more complex as as our brains got a little bit bigger and then a an evolutionary arms race sort of went on that the the better understander you were of, of of your fellow humans and the better you could communicate with and manipulate and understand their motivations and intentions the better you would do and you know that has some appeal to me as well i suppose in in terms of the language instinct and, and things like yeah, that yeah i mean what's just I mean, just shooting from the hip, it's not a serious question, I suppose. I'm, I'm just curious. You, you know more about this stuff than I do. What, what's your gut feeling about it? Yeah, I mean, my general feeling whenever I hear any of those theories that says this is the one thing that explains uh, how we got there is that it's not the one thing, right? It was just a bunch of things. It was a confluence of various factors that feed off each other and amplify each other and 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 iteratively increase the value of of being intelligent through through all of those things at once you know some people say it's it's cooking and we could get more uh, calories that way or it's the uh, social number of you know people that we interact with or it's you know various other it's walking upright it's having dexterity you know all these various things to me it it doesn't make sense to settle on any one of those as the as the prime causal factor, I think they were all convolved with each other uh, in a way that can't be probably decomposed explanatorily in retrospect. That that would be my feeling. But yeah, I think all of those things are, are at play. One thing I will say that you just kind of prompted there is this thinking about other people, right? So being a better understander of other people, as you said, is is really valuable, right? And so what that means is that we the capacity that psychologists call a theory of mind, being able to think about someone else's thoughts becomes really valuable. And there is an argument that actually the, that's why we can think about our own thoughts, because the ability to think about other people's thoughts became valuable. And then it turned out, oh, hey, I can think about my own thoughts at the same time. Right? So the, the self-awareness was an acceptation on, on the value, social value of theory of mind. I, you know, I don't 100% buy that either. I think it's probably both things going on that you, you know, being able to being able to model someone else's mind while not being able to model your own mind doesn't make much sense. They probably co co evolved, but you can at least see a value of modeling minds 
generally, yeah. right, in the social context, which is it's just it's, more, it's just more obvious there than simply the the isolated value of modeling your own mind. I think I, I totally agree. I, I can see the the importance of having that that theory of mind, and I can see how it could be re- recapitulized that to 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 promote self awareness. I suppose the other thing that I guess sort of guides me a little bit more towards the importance of of I guess social dexterity as being a, as being an important factor is that um, it, it is around language and it's it's connected to what we were talking about before which is that you know we the thing about language a bit like letters you have a discrimination between you see an A or you don't see an A and and all words are, are pretty much about putting categories onto yeah. the world and putting those categories is extremely important for us to do interesting mental like or, or construct interesting mental representations from them and, and to do things with them right so uh, again just gut feelings and intuitions here from my side anyway i find it really hard to imagine how how you could have a a, a, a very intelligent species that 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 wasn't using some form of of language to think, not just communicate with yeah. others, but even yeah. to to think. To, to what degree do you reckon is, is language sort of fundamental and required for thinking? I think what language enables us, because we get these categorical entities that we can then manipulate as objects without having to mentally keep track of all the properties of them, right? We can just use it as a label. We can think about dogs without having to constantly say those warm-blooded, furry things with four legs that wag their tails and can bite you, right? I mean, you just couldn't think like that. It would just be cumbersome, right? So now we have a category dog. That's an element that we can use and we can recombine it in an open-ended way to have thoughts and express them sorry, not just to express them, but to have them, I think you're right there, in ways that we couldn't do otherwise. So now there's a couple of ways to think about that. One is that, you know, some people would say, well, the language that we have shapes our thought. I would say that the way that the types of things that we want to think about shapes the elements of our language, right? So we have objects and we have actions and we have mainly, you know, prepositions, which are causal relations or interdependencies between them, right? Those are the elements in the world. The world is structured like that. And so our thought reflects that because it's useful and therefore our language reflects those elements. Um, But once we have that, then I do think it opens up this explosion of infinite open-endedness of abstract thoughts that we can entertain that couldn't have been there before. And of course, the communicative element then is that we can think together, right? We don't have to think alone anymore. And then you could learn something and tell me, and it doesn't, I I immediately get the benefit of the hard work that you've done and then it's cumulative over generations and so on. It's Chris's turn now and I'm going to shut up from here on, but I just got to to mention that I had one of those whoa dude moments there like because I totally agree with you (laughs) that, that the physical world that we care about in which you have, you know, subjects and objects and you know thing, things acting on other things, I could see how that does shape the, the things that we think about. Even when a mathematician or a physicist is thinking about something extraordinarily abstract that we have no personal contact, we they they use physical and geometric analogies uh, in order to think about it. And having that shape our language, I was like. Whoa, yeah, that's, yeah, it. He, <laughs> that's cool. You can have the gif of Matt's head exploding into the universe. <laughs> and that, that, well, that's a, that's a good note, I think, to round off on, Kevin, because I suspect if I don't stop, Matt, you will be here for another hour. Yeah, and uh, yeah. as a guru, Kevin, I give you good marks because you mentioned meaning. And you talk about sense making, you've got consciousness, free will, you know, big things bobbing around. This this could get you in the idea. <laughs> you get marked down because you disparage monocausal accounts. You're not entertaining mystic forces. Um and yeah, you said, you, you said that you didn't know an awful lot about some Yeah, that's not allowed. Like, oh, that's, that's also not, not allowed. allowed. <laughs> you right. can't express uncertainty. And your analogies were not long or flower enough so <laughs> you're, you're you're on this you uh, you've got some positive points but basically right. not gonna cut it <laughs> but uh yeah i i have to say i encourage anyone listening that has an interest in any of these topics we generally don't do book book promotion stuff and i know that you're you didn't you know come on to us but 
I just would recommend your book. I think Matt would too. Um, and to be clear, to be been- clear, we contacted Kevin to please come on our show. <laughs> yeah. His his yeah. agent did That's not contact us. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was saying. And uh, uh, yeah, it, it's been a, a great pleasure and and entertainment. And I I think the key takeaway is that. Essentially, I'm right. That's that's <laughs> what I take away from what you said. And, you know, Matt has a couple of things that he's okay about as well. But, yeah, it's been a pleasure. And, um, yeah, hopefully we can do it again for all our topics. We didn't get you to talk about gurus that much mm. this time, but it might be good to pick your brain on, yeah. on those great. folks. Great. Well, it's been great fun, guys. And, yes, Chris, you're right. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, you to my ears. Okay, and thanks for me too, Kevin. This was great fun. And, uh, yeah, if you can make the time um, in the future, yeah, we'll, we'll have to get you back on to get you to give us your hot takes on the Infosphere and Gurus. Yeah, great. That sounds like, that sounds like fun. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Chris. All right. Bye, Kevin. Bye. Cheers. Cheers.